Nervous? Yes. First time. No, I've been nervous lots of times. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey there, money fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and what a show do we have for you today. Yeah, I know I say that every week, but it's true. On today's show, do you really need to save those big dollars for retirement? And is there a best way to pay off a credit card? Here to help us with all of that and more, we welcome USA Today contributor and host of the Million Dollar Man podcast. Oh my God, Steve Austin's here. Steve Austin's here, everybody. Oh, Uh, Sorry, I read that wrong, folks. Host of the Million Dollar Plan podcast, Peter Dunn. He's a pretty cool dude, too, though. And from the hot new fintech app, DIY.fund, Eric Nissan. Rounding out our awesome lineup today, financial journalist Elena Tweedale. Plus, Mom's excited because we're going to save your career with our new uh, Career Saving Friday segment. Helping us out, we welcome CEO of TheMuse.com and co-author of the book, The New Rules of Work, Catherine Minshew. And now, because Friday starts best when you're stacking Benjamins, Joe Saul Sihai. Oh, that's right. Your ship's come in and hopefully is here to help you stack some Benjamins. Hey, everybody. I am Joe Saul Cihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And what a fantastic day. I love what Doug said about our brand new partnership with TheMuse.com and Catherine Minshew coming down to the basement to kick that off halfway through today's show. But you know, first, what we're going to kick off is you doing better with your money. Because if you head to StackingBenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, you can go to that place where you can comparison shop all the financial tools that you always use. Why do you insist on walking into the bank and just saying, what do you got? When the magic of the best is at your fingertips, checking accounts that are the best, savings accounts that are the best, CDs that are the best, student loan refinances that are the best, and more. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. You know, if you pay your credit cards off every month and you're not getting rewards, man, are you missing out? And if we click over on magnify money to reward cards, guess what? The Alliant Cashback Visa Signature Card, two and a quarter percent back. Bam. How about that? Gets a B when it comes to the grade for the card, $59 annual fee waived the first year. Uh, But that's the number one. If you want a 0% card and 2% cash back, how about this? The Fidelity Rewards Visa Signature Card, it says. I don't have relationships with either of those. You know what? I just have a relationship with Magnify Money like you should so that you can comparison shop stuff that's the best in class. And uh, so excited that uh, we're going to have Nick from Magnify Money back on our Thursday SB Live, uh, Facebook Live which happens uh, Thursdays at noon. Most Thursdays, I've been out of town for a couple weeks, so those are kind of spotty here, but we'll pick them up again. Every Thursday that I'm back in the basement, we'll definitely have uh, somebody like Nick on or friends at Magnify Money or Gary from Roofstock, all these crazy, crazy friends of ours. Hey, and speaking of crazy, if you're going to get crazy and actually educate your kids about money, you know where you go? Fam Zoo. Because if you want to give your kids a financial education about how plastic actually works, but not just plastic, also how the real world works. I mean, budgets, stocks, loans, whatever you want to do, it's all available at FamZoo because it's a handy, award-winning app and prepaid cards that your kids get. Here's how it works. Parents can order the cards in just a few minutes at famzoo.com. Kids get their own individual cards, and they can make their own purchases. And this is the key. Here's what I like. I like letting kids make the mistake. And I know a lot of parents, they want to stop their kids. They see them you know, buying junk, and they go, oh, don't make that purchase. No, no, no. Let them make that purchase. Then a week later, when the junk is junkified, that's the Joe word for the day, junkified, then you circle back so they don't do it again. Let them make the small mistakes at home, mom and dad, so that they avoid the big mistakes later. FamZoo helps you do that, helps you monitor what your kids are doing. You can move money to the kids, keep an eye on their activity, even lock the cards if it's necessary. 
Of course, FAMZU sounds familiar because Bill Dwight, FAMZU chief dad over there, has been on the show a couple times. StackingBenjamins.com forward slash FAMZU, like family zoo, FAMZU. Uh, StackingBenjamins.com forward slash FAMZU. All right, we've got a huge zoo of a podcast for you today. The greatest money show on earth is about to begin. Let's roll it. All right, let's walk across the basement here to my dad's shortwave and get ready for another week. And you know what? We're going to kick all of our regular contributors to the curb because we got three new ones. And actually, the guy who's the most regular, and we're not talking about X, is from USA Today and the Million Dollar Plan podcast, Mr. Peter Dunn. I'm glad to be the most regular person on the panel. I'm going to take that to my doctor and uh, ask for a sticker. That's, that's fantastic. So how regular are you, Pete? Very. Thank you. This isn't weird at all. So let's just keep rolling. (laughs) Fantastic. We're going to go down to Orlando, Florida. He's been on the podcast before. During our FinTech segment, we talked about his passion, which is DIY.fun. It's Mr. Eric Nissan. Nice to be on again. So I think that makes me the second most regular person. You are the the second most regular. This is already a train wreck in a hurry. (laughs) Uh, uh, Tell us about uh, DIY fun for people that missed that episode. I come from the hedge fund industry, and so what we built is a way for people to invest and manage their portfolio holistically like a hedge fund or like a financial planner would do for you. Awesome, and we're glad to have you back here with us. And let's move up the coast to Philadelphia where she moved just yesterday, and now she's wondering what the heck she's doing here on my dad's shortwave. Elena Twendale joins us. Hi, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but I guess... Since this is my first time on the show, this makes me the least regular person you're the, here. You're the least regular. She had to go there. <laughs> so, <laughs> I had to do it. I had to do it. it but was, I'm happy to be here. It was sitting right there. And you know what's funny is that we've talked about your articles here, and I'm so glad that you're finally with us because you write all over the internet. I do. I do. I've been writing about money for 20 years, and I love it. And also, it's funny because whenever I see your name, I always want to say Tweedale. Is it Tweedale or Tweedale? It actually is Tweedale. It's it's spelled phonetically incorrect. So it is spelled with one E, but it's pronounced as if there are two E's. So that's so funny, Elena. I've had it right all these years and I get it wrong for the podcast. That's good. <laughs> You're far from alone. Everybody messes that name up. That's awesome. Well, not like my name. Saul Sihai is very easy. So Right, right. Yeah. Well, let's kick this one off with a piece from Market Watch. And this was, I found this incredibly interesting and I love to get all of your takes on it. This is written by Alessandra Melito. It says, this person asked the internet if it was necessary to save so much for retirement. The response was surprising. And Pete, I think we'll start with you because this person on Reddit said, you know, I don't think I need to be saving as much as as, uh, a lot of people. And basically the internet said they know how to save. Yeah, that has not been my experience in the financial planning industry that I've never really met anyone that said they oversaved. It's like when someone dies, no one ever says, well, this is too much life insurance. Please take 25 right. yeah. um, I, You know, first of all, I think people underestimate health care coverage, and uh, that's only going to get worse going forward. And I think the other factor here is people just don't want to uh, control their lifestyle, so they make up this excuse as though your financial life gets easier as you age, therefore you don't need money, which, of course, in my opinion, is not true at all. No, because you want more for your goals and for the, for the fun stuff. Yeah, but I just, I mean, obviously, if one of us is going to talk about inflation, I'll, I'll leave it to the uh, two other professionals on this uh, podcast. I mean, three other, Joe, you're included too. Um, but no, I just I just think that people think their financial life gets easier the longer they live it. But that's just not the case. If you're If you have bad decisions, they only compound. It's not, I, I always think that's just a huge misconception. People think it just gets easier because you age. And that's just well, not- isn't the biggest deal here that this person was 25 years old. I am doubt he has a family and kids and that doesn't kick in and hit you in the head later in life. So I'm assuming he has no idea what he's up for. That's funny yeah. because everything's it changed for me when family and kids hit. I mean, everything. When I w- used to meet with clients. Well, and Pete, back to you. When you meet with clients, you probably see that that changes everything. I think it does. I, I think there's something too about hitting your early thirties, which is your, I always think is your stuff phase. When you get into a little bit of money, you just keep buying stuff, you got all this stuff. And then once you work your way through that, then you realize 
yeah, and I got a bunch of stuff. I probably need money now. And I think that's when the crossover point takes place for me. Well, let's go over. We'll bring Elena in here in just a second, but let's read what uh, this person told the internet they had. They said, quote, while I understand the importance of saving for retirement, seems to me saving 12% of my pre-tax income will generate more than enough savings for our retirement goals. He's 25, to Eric's point, earns $80,000, expects to retire at 65 with a 6% estimated return and is contributing $900 a month before a 4% employer match. That would leave him with about $2.5 million or about $75,000 withdrawn annually. Sounds like a lot of money, Elena. What's he missing? He's missing inflation. Absolutely. So he's 25, which is wonderful that he's thinking about saving now. But he has 40 years until he retires. He said he plans to retire at age 65. So that 75000 in today's dollars is going to be worth just a little more than $20,000 in 40 years. So if he wants to retire living the same lifestyle that 75000 will afford him today, he needs to be saving much more than that for the future. To Eric's point, for you and your family, Elena, because I believe you have a spouse and children. Um, I do. Yeah. Did everything change here when you hit the family speed bump? Yeah. Yeah. I took some time off from work. So there was some change in our income level when the kids came along. You don't necessarily anticipate you're going to do that. I know I didn't expect that I was going to do that. Sometimes what you think you're going to do and what you do do are very different in life. So it makes sense to prepare as much as you can before you hit some of these crazy life phases, because you might decide to do something that if you have the financial resources to do to them, you're set up for that option. Whereas if you didn't necessarily take those pre-steps beforehand, you have fewer options. You don't have as much padding, financial padding to get you where you want to go. I like that phrase, financial padding. (laughs) Another thing for me though, too, Joe, is sometimes people think they're just going to moderately save, moderately save, moderately save their, their entire career. When the better approach is to run hard to make it easier later. Like, Uh, For me personally, I'm trying to make tomorrow easier. I don't want to have to battle this later. And I think sometimes 20-somethings, either this generation's 20-somethings or the previous generation, any generation's 20-somethings, they don't realize they're just trying to make it easier on themselves by running hard now as opposed to moderately saving. Yeah. Eric, you know, your whole program at DIY Fund is set up to help people do a lot of stuff themselves. What are some of the, the assumptions that people miss or that they get wrong? Well, I mean, I think, you know, this person posted up that, oh, I'm going to earn, you know, this much percent every year and I'll retire with this much money. And so he, you know, multiplied and put it together. But there's definitely down peaks and troughs in what you're earning. You could argue that the markets are extremely high now. You put in money today, it could take you 10. If there's a decline, could take you 10, 20 years to get back to where you were. And you might not have earned anything during that period. So there's just so many assumptions in what he's written here that uh, I think it sound good on paper, but just don't play out well. Yeah, I love this idea of starting early and building to Lena's point, financial padding. Let's let's go let's go to our second piece. Uh, it's CNN Money. This is by Danielle Weiner Bronner. The smartest way to pay off credit card debt. Elena, you went last first time, so we're bringing you front and center this time. Is there a best way to pay off credit card debt? I don't know if there's a best way, but there are two commonly accepted ways. One is the avalanche method, where you tackle your credit cards with the highest interest rate first. And the other is the snowball method, where you tackle the credit cards with the lowest balance first. And they both have their advantages. The avalanche method, you probably will pay less in interest over time because you're paying off those high interest cards first. But that discounts the psychology that goes along with paying off your debts. If you're paying off your smaller balances first, you kind of get a little bit of a sense of satisfaction. Hey, look, I just accomplished something. Now I feel good. I'm going to keep moving forward. So I think a lot of it comes down to the type of person you are, knowing your own personality and knowing what's going to motivate you. Is it getting the high interest paid off first or is it knowing that you've had some small successes that you can roll forward and start tackling those other balances afterwards? Pete, do you see yourself on the million dollar plan when somebody comes to you with debt on the show, leaning toward one of two of Elena's approaches? I like the uh, snowball or we call it the momentum method a little bit better because of human nature, right? I I think sometimes it's just harder to see those results with the avalanche method. And the reality is if people are that much in debt, especially if it's consumer debt, they're not really the best at technicalities, Joe. So maybe they shouldn't go the route that's technically the best, which is the avalanche method. Maybe they should go the one that that involves emotion and impulse. And that would be the 
snowball method. So I tend to like the snowball method better, but I you always have to admit that technically the avalanche method is better because it's less expensive. Are you trying to say emotion got them there, so emotion's going to bring them back out? I mean, if I wrote Hallmark cards, I <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that good a writer, as an emailer told me tonight. Right. <laughs> Isn't that great? I bet you get great email at USA Today. We could do a whole episode on it. I got one today that says, I know you're a financial guy and not a writer. Meanwhile, I've written 10 books and written for a newspaper for five years. But whatever. I appreciate the constructive criticism, Jeff. <laughs> from Milwaukee. Not that, not that Pete's holding anything against Jeff. Well, Elena, that could be said for you, too. I bet you do. Do you read the comments on the stuff you write? I don't, and I intentionally do not. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Eric, let's bring you in. You know, you're a data guy. You're a hedge fund guy. Yeah, and I'm like listening to, and I understand the emotional side of it for sure. And I don't deal with clients directly. And so, you know, I'm going to say this with a caveat, but I, I just can't imagine why you wouldn't want to pay off your, if, if it's going to cost you more and have you in debt longer, you know, get rid of that high paying debt first. It's, to me, it would make sense. But again, uh, you know, if you're dealing with clients and they're not able to, make headway using that, then, you know, hey, I'll let you guys fight that one out. Well, here's my question is knowing that there's the behavior aspect of the snowball method is there and that behavior is getting those wins. Is there a way, is there some technology that you guys have seen that will allow you to use the avalanche method to, to Eric's point and Elena's point pays it off quicker? Well, actually, to everybody's point, right? Pays it off quicker, but also covers what Pete's talking about, which is, you know, getting those wins. But wouldn't you want to see the net amount you're paying out every month and the amount of debt declining? I mean, I think seeing those two numbers, instead of just saying I have four, you know, separate checks to write and I'm writing three, but I'm writing a more money, you know, in total, you know, so I think just looking at it, your debt holistically. Yeah, it seems did like. They, did they not do that? Uh, you mean people? Just people in yeah. general? Heck, I don't yeah. know. Elena? Well, when I was paying off my credit cards, because I'll admit I once upon a time did have a credit card balance, mostly because they came to my college campus and gave me a branded duffel bag, which I don't think they do anymore. But for me, the psychology of paying off the small balances really was helpful. And then using the amount that I was paying toward that small balance, adding it to my next balance, and then you know getting to the next payment faster really helped to me. And I knew what the numbers were. I'm very old school. I don't use any systems. I write it all in an Excel spreadsheet. I input it all in an Excel spreadsheet. Just knowing that I had those paid off really helped me have the momentum that I needed to move forward. It's funny because when I would start with people, I generally, Pete, I generally start off with that snowball method. But once we got the first couple and they got some wins under their belt, I felt like we didn't really need it anymore. So we could switch over to the avalanche method. I always think it's like when someone starts working out for the first time, you know, they, they want a reason to keep working out. But once they've committed, then yeah, switch up the methodology. But if I'm eating kale for two weeks straight and I'm running for two weeks straight and I don't see any weight loss or body change, I'm done. No more kale. I want a pizza. And so I think that's the switchover point when they're no longer interested in getting out of debt. They're committed. And so then you can switch the avalanche. And we call that the Joe method around here. We call it the Joe method of getting out of debt. But the, which is the perfect way. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. But you lost me at kale. What the hell is this kale thing? I don't know. I saw it at the grocery store. <laughs> it's just horrible. I feel current. I I think I've had kale twice. Elena, do you eat kale? I love kale. Oh. Kale, so spinach, arugula. I'm a greens girl. Well, kale's still in. I thought that went out like five years ago. Right. That that. You I don't know what's in. I just love the greens. <laughs> now who's regular? I'm sorry. I don't <laughs> I'm sorry, Joe. <laughs> Always the best joke. So one where we return to the beginning of the show. All right, let's finish this. Let's cap this off. I think it's a good place to leave credit card debt. Let's cap this one off with a piece I like from Motley Fool. Let's get away from money and uh, what we do with our money. Instead, talk about earning money because all three of you, I know all three of you well enough to know you're really busy people with a very full work life, but you also juggle a lot of other things. This is a piece about four tips for a better work-life balance. It is written by Marie Backman. So, Eric, let's start with you. You know, these four tips for better work-life balance. How do you maintain when you're trying to get, you know, DIY fund continuing to roll like it has been and still have kids? Yeah, I mean, this article is all about turning off your phone and disconnecting. But I'm a techie, right? So I've set up my life so I can grab my laptop and I can be productive anywhere at any time. And to me, that's work-life balance. 
because I can sit in a room with my kids and be productive and work and also, you know, get quiet as well whenever I need it, or I can go and travel and also be productive. So for me, that's that work-life balance where I don't feel like I'm missing out on things going around me, but I'm also getting work done. The, the article really is focused on like, you know, turn off your phone. I don't know whoever turns off their phone. I don't know how that works, but. I've actually turned off notifications that I've been with people, Elena, that have their notifications on. And I feel like I'm with somebody who's having seizures <laughs> like over and over there. Do, do you turn off your phone? So I, at a certain point of time in the evening, I have it set so that my notifications don't make a noise on my phone. But if I chose to look at my phone, I would see that they were there. So that way I don't head turn every time that there's a noise. But if I feel that I want to check it, I can check it. And let me ask you this. Do you really think if Eric's sitting in a room with his kids and he's doing work, is he really getting work-life balance? You know, in some ways, yes, because Eric or somebody who has an office job may have left the office an hour earlier than their colleagues so they can pick up their children. And then spending an hour checking their phone later that night might be the way that they've created that work-life balance for themselves so that they could be home with their families. So I think sometimes, yes. Pete, how can I stop our participants from being so damn nice to each other? I've taken to watching fishing videos on YouTube recently, and that's my work-life balance. I have no idea why. They are the most appealing things in the world, and I can't stop. And that's how I uh, decompress after a long day. But no, my me- that is true, by the way. But my methodology is <laughs> I work super hard in the morning, and then in the afternoon when I start to fade, I just leave. I do, mean, do my you? staff knows I'm out because my brain's dead, and I just got to go, and then I go do my stuff I got to do. Well, I like this one, Eric, about taking your vacation day. So the four on here, turn off your phone. We've talked a lot about that. Work fewer hours during less busy periods. Uh, So there's periods of the year that are busy, others that aren't. Take your vacation days and find ways to be more productive at work. But it seems like at the point of the business where you and Wendy are right now, Eric, it seems like taking vacation days would be a really tough thing to do. It's stressful because, you know, you're running your own business and you got to make sure things are operating and, and well. But that's the choice I made. I don't know that that's the norm of, you know, who this article is referring to. But I, you know, I also do agree with uh, Pete. If you can't, if you're at the point where you're staring at the screen and it ain't making sense, you know, just shut down and you'll be more productive the next day or later on when you look at it and you're like, oh, that, you know, that's something that you would have struggled with for hours becomes like a minute exercise to complete. So, and that goes hand in hand with taking vacation time and you got to turn off when you're just not productive anymore. Well, and Elena being a freelancer, I mean, if you're not writing, you're not making money. Oh, that's true. And I'm, I have to admit, I'm pretty terrible about the work-life balance situation. I'm notorious for walking past my office and saying, oh, I'm just going to check email for 10 minutes. And then two hours later, there I am thinking, oh, what happened to my evening? So yeah, but you know, that said, I do want to comment on this vacation days situation. It's not just about taking the vacation days to recharge, but it's also about if you are in a leadership position at your company, it's also about setting the tone for what's standard procedure within your workplace. So if your subordinates see that when you're not taking your vacation or that when you do, you're checking your emails, you're calling into conference calls, they're going to assume that that's something that they're required to do in that workplace. So if you really want your employees to take that time off, you kind of have to set the tone for the behavior you want to see mirrored within your workplace. You know, I agree with that, but there's another component of that too. Like here at our offices, we used to have a, it was called the get ish done. Ish was a replacement word for something I'd rather not say in your show. It was a get ish done policy, which just meant you have all the vacation time you want. Just get your ish done. But then Joe, that backfired because people wanted structure. So I had to then give people a structured amount of time to go on vacation And then they took it, but they weren't taking vacation days because they felt like it was a test. So vacation can backfire in in one of many ways. Which is another reason, though, Pete, why it's got to come from the top. You know, I mean, it's it's up to you then to prove that it's not a test. Or did you? Did did you? Yeah, I would just get out. Like I would get my stuff done. I'm like, peace. I'm out. I'm leaving because I'm done. But then I, I don't. It didn't work. Like we did it for a few years, and then people seriously were getting anxiety over it. So now everyone's got PTO days. Now I feel like a big Goliath uh, of a corporation. Wow. And Eric, I bet you think of him as a big Goliath of a corporation being a new startup. Uh, it definitely, it's a different, different animal. It certainly <laughs> That's is. Right. I just got to take a quick break from our awesome discussion with 
Elena, Eric, and Pete to say a big thanks to the people who've said so much good stuff about our Stacking Benjamins courses. You know, you come here not to learn anything, but just to be entertained. And if you're ready to take the next step, we've got some courses for you. How about saving more money? Learn how to save half your income by going to stackingbenjamins.com. Scroll down just a little bit and you'll see you can learn tips and tricks to save more money than you thought before. We'll talk about minimalism, hiding money from yourself, interesting ways to save on housing, maximizing your food budget, getting from point A to point B, increasing your income, where to put your savings, most of all, helping you stay motivated. Or if you're worried about the tax code, work for yourself, worried about how much you pay to the man, feel like you're getting a raw deal, we have a course called Learn How to Legally Cheat on Your Taxes. Obviously, we're not going to teach you how to cheat on your taxes, but we will make you feel like a cheater because you're going to be doing something most people aren't, and that is you'll be maximizing the tax code to work for you. StackingBenjamins.com. Just scroll down slightly, and you'll see our two courses. Sign up for those today. All right. uh, You may know that a few months ago, we had uh, Catherine Minshew and her counterpart, Alex Kavakalis, on our show talking about their awesome book, The New Rules of Work. And guess what? We started working with them and themuse.com to bring Catherine Minshew here more often. And I'm so excited. So let's get into making your career better. How do you make more money? You make more money at work. Let's get to work with Catherine Minshew. And Catherine Minshew joins us. Have a seat. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me back. Well, I'm so excited about this collaboration between us. I just think, obviously, The Muse is my favorite site for careers and for everything about making money. You have a piece I, th- I thought would be great for us to start off with, and it was four networking mistakes worse than starting a convo with. So about this weather, that's a horrible way to start, by the way. It is. You know, it's um, it's kind of become the poster child for the trite beginning. And I think when there are so many other ways to start a conversation, why choose something that's kind of generic? Yeah. Hey, I want to talk to you, but I don't know what to talk to you about. So let's go through these mistakes because you wrote this initially for Inc. A mistake number one, forgetting conversational etiquette. What do you mean? Yeah, what I mean is that sometimes people think of networking as so transactional that they forget that it's at its, you know, at its essence, a human interaction. And so you see this when people forget the etiquette of asking other people about themselves or when they just steamroll right into the conversation with them, their background, what they want. In fact, research shows that listening and pulling out the other person is a much more effective way of beginning a networking conversation and starting a relationship that can actually last. So starting a relationship then, Catherine, you're saying with it's more about you than me. Exactly. There's actually an 80-20 rule. It's a business coach, Allison McKinsey, who recommends keeping 80% of the conversation focused on your partner and about 20% on yourself. And of course, if they've heard of this rule too, you can get into a little bit of trouble. So I absolutely recommend, you know, answering their questions with engaging details and, and, you know, not being afraid to bring a little of your sort of whole human self to the conversation, but as much as you can, making sure that you're just as invested in learning and listening to them as you are in getting your own point across. I don't want to discourage people because when I am at social events or at parties or at networking events, I don't see enough people practice what we're talking about. But I have seen a few people, and I'm sure you have too, that go way too far the other way. And I think it's really annoying when I can't ever bend the conversation back to you. How do you, how do you kind of juggle the two of those? Absolutely. I think that's a great point. Nobody wants to feel like they're being interrogated. So if you could imagine your conversation taking place on an episode of CSI in the interrogation room, you're going way too far. Um, You know, I think it's helpful to allow people to finish their thoughts before asking them another question and to really honor the fact that they may want to turn around the question and ask you, well, so wait a second, you know, what do you do and why do you love it? Or whatever the counterpoint is, um, being willing to share about yourself. And again, especially in a sort of human, friendly, authentic way is a really important part of making sure that a conversation goes both ways. I think that people that show up super prepared are the ones that kind of jump into, here's why I'm here and this is networking and it feels so forced. But you say also, though, mistake number two is if you show up completely unprepared, that's a problem. 
Exactly. And like in many areas of life, going to either extreme can be problematic. So what you're looking for is something that's right in the middle. And for mistake number two, what I was going for is this idea that if you're going to an event, spending five to 10 minutes ahead of time, getting the attendee list or learning a little bit more about where you're going and who's going to be there is time really well spent. For example, you might find out that someone who's going to be attending is from a company you're interested in or is a potential partner for a business relationship. The more you know that ahead of time, the more you can keep an eye out for the individual you're looking for and make sure that you're sort of showing up and putting your best foot forward. Yeah, have a have a target list of things that you want to get done during that hour or however long it is. Exactly. And and like you said, you can go to the other extreme where you, you know, people feel like you're just, are you this person? No. All right. Goodbye. You don't ever want people to feel like you're just crossing names off a list or you're checking boxes. Because again, you know, as with most human relationships, people want to be engaged with naturally, authentically, openly. But it's not a bad idea to do a little prep and to have a few ideas and goals for yourself in mind. It also means that if you come across someone that you're excited to meet, you're not caught completely flat footed, sort right. of blurting out, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I like your blog. And maybe instead you have something really specific that you want to bring up or ask them about that shows that you know who they are, you've done your homework. And again, it's it's a much more natural way to start a really good conversation. But mistake number three on your list of four here is that you can kind of take your preparation too far. Absolutely. No one wants to feel like they're being stalked. Right. And I think that there's a fine line here <laughs> between, um, again, treating people warmly, treating them openly, but but not acting like someone is your new best friend. So this can take on a few forms. One, don't share too many personal details. This is not a time, especially in a first or second networking conversation, to talk badly about other people, to complain about your job, you know, complaining about a particularly terrible spate of, of snow, for example. Sure, that might be fine. But in general, try to, you know, not to dump too many negative things on people. And then the second point in this area is um, when you do know a lot about people, perhaps from researching them or because you're a fan of their work, um, it's it's acceptable to compliment on them on something that they've done, but maybe try and stay away from the personal details. So for example, I would not recommend going up to someone and saying, wow, that pasta that you cooked and posted on Instagram two weeks ago sure looked delicious. Oh my. If you've never met them before. <laughs> Yeah, that might have a little creepy factor to it. I think that gets worse if there's alcoholic beverages, because some of these things that I go to that is alcohol involved. And I remember one time when I made a fool out of myself, Catherine, and I hadn't eaten and I had a drink. I got it halfway down and I realized all of a sudden I was buzzed. And that's a problem. Mm -hmm. It's really dangerous. And that's why I often recommend if you can start with something like a sparkling water with lime or something that's non-alcoholic or lightly al alcoholic and make sure that you're feeling good. And, and I personally try and recommend one beverage per networking event or at least, you know, one per hour, hour and a half, two hours. Themuse.com talks a lot about this. It obviously depends on the type of event. Is it a more casual networking get together that a friend is organizing versus a larger industry conference? But in general, if you're feeling the alcohol, it's probably not a good thing when you're trying to network professionally. Right. I'm sure we'll talk about the holiday parties later when we get closer to the holidays, but I just remember so many horror stories of people making a big mistake of thinking it was a party and not a company party. But no, Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many people come to the Muse a couple days after the biggest holiday party dates, Googling things like, how do you apologize for something you did at a holiday party? Right. And I just, don't put yourself in that situation, yeah. please. <laughs> That's the best way, back out of it ahead of time. And the last one is, after the event, you say that people can follow up the wrong way. Absolutely. What I mean by that is that I think a good follow-up is a short, sweet note sent within about 24 hours, ideally an email, although if you're a handwritten note person, that's obviously perfectly acceptable, telling people that you enjoyed meeting them. Um, if there's something that you discussed, you can obviously send a follow-up article or an additional comment on it, something that's friendly, that continues the relationship, but that's not overly aggressive. The mistake that I see people fall into is saying something like, hey, great to meet you. Can you get me a job at your company? Or so good to talk with you. Can you make this introduction to this very important business contact you wow. have without knowing anything else about me? Now, it's it's obviously appropriate to say, you know, by the way, I'm really interested in working at so-and-so. And if you'd be willing to talk more or forward on my resume, let me know. Or asking in a way that is a little bit more respectful of the fact that you just met the other night. But I think where people can go wrong is assuming that, you know, we had a great 
five minute conversation. Therefore, they owe me this introduction right. or this favor. And they don't. They're still, um, you know, just transitioning from being a stranger to an acquaintance. So I think the more you can treat people with respect for their time, the more that they're going to appreciate that. Oh, it's fantastic advice. I'm going to link to this uh, piece at themuse.com on our show notes, stackybenjamins.com. But two, two questions for you before you go. Number one, how did the book tour end up? Because the new rules of work I gave to both of my kids who were just graduating from college and it was perfect, but it was even perfect for me. And I've, you know, not my first rodeo, Catherine, but how did it work out? I'm so glad to hear it. No, it's, it's been such a fun process. I am, I'm really proud to say we made the Wall Street Journal national bestseller list, of course. which was a, a huge goal and something that Alex and I are really excited about. And then, you know, we've we've seen it pop up in the most interesting places. I think as a frequent business traveler, I've gotten so much pleasure from seeing the number of airport bookstores that it's in. <laughs> right. And then, of course, you know, getting those emails from not only individuals, but public librarians or people who work in career services saying how much the book has meant to them and how helpful it's been. I think that's been one of the most incredible parts of the process for me. So I'm, I'm really excited for it to continue going. We're hoping this is a book that sort of becomes part of the career and job search stable for years to come. But it's been off to a great start and I, I couldn't have asked for anything more. Well, and then second, I, you know, I'll be seen lurking around the muse.com, but tell everybody what's going on there right now. Absolutely. So the muse.com, we have uh, around 50 million people every year who are coming to the muse to get help navigating their career, making a big change, finding a new job, getting a promotion, any of the sort of core career issues that, um, you know, that you might come across in your day to day. And so we're obviously signing up a lot of new companies. We work with probably about about 700 now of the biggest employers in the country from, you know, your Facebook and Dropbox and other tech companies to um, Marriott, BMW, Johnson and Johnson, et cetera. Um, so really excited about what we're seeing on that side. And we've got a couple of really neat consumer innovations that we're releasing later this fall to allow people to engage more authentically and get advice sort of on the go as they need it. I don't want to get too, you know, to get right. teased, teased too much, <laughs> right. but um, our product and engineering team is really hard at work at something that I am so excited about. And so in the next month or two, we should have a little more to share on that. Well, sounds like you make networking even easier. <laughs> exactly. Right. I hope so. You know, it's funny. I think that um, people are really hungry for more authentic ways to connect with other people. And the yeah. challenge is technology doesn't always facilitate real connections. Sometimes it facilitates transactions or, you know, they, I think we can all some, uh, kind of empathize with opening up your LinkedIn network connections and having a hundred requests from people right. you've never met before. Right. Like right. how do you create more <laughs> human relationships that aren't just based on kind of the immediate give and take, but that are really based on sharing knowledge and helping other people succeed in their careers. You mean I can't just swipe left or swipe right when it comes to my career? Come on. <laughs> right. Yeah. Shockingly. Right. No. <laughs> Catherine Minchie, thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks so much for having me. It was a great time as always. And we'll have a link to the new rules of work, the book, if you want to buy it through our site and help the show or also to themuse.com for help with your career. All right, let's head back to this great discussion with Elena Tweedale, Eric Nissan, and Pete the Planner. So anybody else have any other things that you do to make sure that uh, that work-life balance exists? You know, for me, working out is really a big part. And I, I, I really, I can't stand working out, but I find that if I don't do it, I find that if I don't do it, man, I totally burn the candle at both ends. I don't like to work out. <laughs> no? no I, I, I just feel like I had to say something. No, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else have any uh, work-life balance things that you do? Tricks? Anybody? Bueller? Right. Joe, where do you work from? You're, you're, uh, aren't you around the family a lot? I'm, I'm on, I'm, I've worked from my mom's basement. Of course, I'm around the family <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and so, are you, where, are you able to work while you're in the, uh, if at the parents' house? Well, the yes, good, right? the good, the good thing for me is that mom's away a lot, and my kids, my kids. The fun thing about that is that my daughter's starting her new job in Kansas City. My son has one more semester of college to go, and pretty much lives in Austin. So. While I don't like that, I love seeing my kids. It's still, I noticed that my career took off when it was, you know, just the two of us here at home. Like, yeah. because, because now I don't have distractions. I mean, I'm, I'm here. So 
Yeah. I mean, I think the issue with that or, or what, you know, what I described is that when does your workday end? And that that's what really becomes a challenge because you can work from anywhere. You can turn your laptop on at any time. And so when is your and, you know, if you're an employee and you're expected to be on call or you can do that. I mean, you know, you it, it's all about who's your boss, who's, you know, how understanding they are. How are they setting the tone? Those are all points that I do agree with. And then, uh, you know, so that they can be adults about it and manage their day and be productive. Yeah. Well, the Tony Danza moment there when he said, who's the boss? But <laughs> I let it go because I didn't want to have one. on a roll. Do, do, do oh, like half the listeners like, who's Tony Danza? I was just going to say the same thing. <laughs> I know. I, I, I tend to date myself that way. Pete loses half the audience. If Paula were here, she'd have no idea what the hell we were talking about. <laughs> All right. I think that's going to do it for today. Uh, Elena, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, where are you writing now? Tell us what's up with Elena Tweedale. Well, you know, I actually am working on a new project in development. I'm launching a blog within the next couple of months. Awesome. So I hope everyone will check it out. It's uh, www.wealthyfitandwise.com coming soon. Awesome. And people can go there. Can they sign up for something to, to remind them that it's coming? I probably should set that up. <laughs> that's, that's great. Well, hopefully, soon. hopefully by the time this airs, if not, either way, we'll put a link to it on our show notes at stackybenjamins.com. Sounds good. Yeah, cool. Eric, what's going on with the crazy team at DIY Fund now? Because you uh, guys always have something yeah, new going. We're busy, busy. We just won a Benzig Award, which was very exciting for us. Um, anybody interested in learning about what we do? Uh, www.diy.fund. And you guys have the amazing Hannah Rounds writing for you on your blog, we too. We do. Hannah's great. Yeah, fantastic team over there. And we'll also link to DIY Fund on our show notes. Pete, thanks for being the most regular of our irregulars here. My pleasure. It was a, <laughs> it was a good time. This week's USA Today column, which uh, publishes, I don't know, they never tell me, mental health and money. I'm talking about how the mental health crisis in America has a special relationship with money from things like compulsive buying disorder all the way down to tr uh, how stress then leads to financial stress, which leads to stress, then financial stress. So it's a really uplifting column, Joe. Very <laughs> uplifting column. Well, but but reading about stress and having a plan, I think, is a good thing. As long as there's an ad for, like, uh, you know, something peaceful, like Calgon. Also dating myself with a Calgon reference. Joe, in the show. <laughs> right, right. That's a, Thank God you didn't say kale, so that's good. Uh, no, we can't stop. We got to talk about the million dollar plan. What's happening at the podcast? I guess it's going well. We've, we of course have got the, uh, the, the, it hooked up with the television show. So at Pete, the TV, we've got a pretty new wall on the set. I'm in here right now. I came over from home. I'm in the studio right now. So yeah, check out million dollar plan podcast. We, we, uh, tell people the day they'll be a millionaire and then we show them how to move that day up. That's what we do. Yeah, that's really cool. And we'll link to all that. All right. Thanks for playing guys. Thanks, Joe. Really great being on. Yeah, thanks for having us. Oh, that's going to do it for today. And man, we've got some good stuff for you coming up next week on the show. More about that in a second. And also more about the game that we're playing. If you're new to the show, you'll want to know about that. First, got to say a big thanks to everybody who's gone to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. Because when you hit magnify money, you know what you find? That that checking account you have, that savings account you have, they're not as good as you thought they were because you just went into your bank instead of comparison shopping. Why do we comparison shop everything else, but we don't comparison shop those things that can actually bring us much, much better things like a better savings account, reward credit cards, or if you don't pay them off, a better strategy to pay them off. There's a fantastic debt guide over there about how to get out of debt. You'll want to check that out. As we do usually on Friday, let's go over to Magnify Money, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money and look. And as we record this, again, two at 1.4. So if your savings account is not at 1.4, and I'll bet it ain't, you want to head to Magnify Money, two at 1.4, one at 1.35, one at 1. Point, actually, four at 1.3. One at 1.26, 1.25, 1.21, a couple there, and then uh, down at 1.2. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. And you know what? You're teaching your kids about money. If you're trying to do that, but you're wondering, 
how to teach them the way things are now instead of when you grew up? Well, guess what? We've got the answer. Fam Zoo. If you go to stackybenjamins.com forward slash fam zoo, might sound familiar to you because their founder, Bill Dwight, has been on the show a couple times to talk about kids and money. And for a decade, he's been on a mission to help parents be better money mentors to kids. And guess what? When it comes to Fam Zoo, Read the reviews and you will see for yourself. It's a financial education kit that is an award-winning app and prepaid debit cards that you hook up to your account as a parent, which means that you can move money over there. You can watch how they spend money. You can give them allowances. You can decide if they decide to take out a loan from you. You can charge them interest. You can do so many things, uh, track stocks. You've got so many different things you can do with the FamZoo app and the FamZoo tools. Don't be like me and have your kids, well, not like me. Don't be like my parents and have your kid go to college and not know anything about plastic and how it works. I made a mess out of mine because we never talked about it. Give your kids the education at home, stackybenjamins.com forward slash fam zoo. All right, let's talk about uh, the game. For those of you new to Stacking Benjamins, we play a game on Fridays. My usual Monday, Wednesday co-host, OG, isn't here. And so I play a game just to entertain me and to bring you along with me. This is week number two of this game, and each week we have a clue. The clue is either in the title of the show, in the description of the show, or in the few, first few sentences of the show. Start putting those together and uh, email me when you have the answer. If you're within 24 hours of the first person that has the answer, your name goes in a hat, and the winner we send a prize package to that's made specifically for you. So uh, this week, can you get it? Maybe, but I doubt it. Let's move on to next week. Next week on the show, on Monday, I'm so excited because New York Times bestselling author John Acuff who uh, wrote this great book called Do Over, and he talked a lot in the past about starting. Guess what he found out? Problem isn't getting started with your goals, it's finishing. And so his new book is called Finish, Give Yourself the Gift of Done, and we're going to make sure we wring as much out of him as possible about getting done. So if you're somebody who starts but doesn't finish, you want to be here on Monday as John Acuff uh, will tell us some things from the book. And then on Wednesday, love this guy, John Hope Bryant. John's got a great book called The Memo. Uh, that's awesome for all those of you that didn't get the memo about how the real world works and you need to know, well, he's going to talk about uh, how to get the memo and you know what, taking control of your financial future. And then on the Friday round table from the great blog, Adventure Rich, Mrs. Adventure Rich is going to join Len Penzo and I and our uh, Friday FinTech segment, a cool site called Ask Vet. And if you've got pets uh, this is this is a technology that you'll want to know about uh, because pets can be expensive. All right, that's next week on the show. Go stack some Benjamins, everybody. We'll see you soon. Special thanks to Pete the Planner for joining us today. You'll find more about the Million Dollar Plan podcast wherever you listen to this show. Special thanks also to Eric Nissan from DIY Fund for joining us. Ready to use the tools the pros use with your money? Check out DIY.fund for more. And finally, thank you to Elena Tweedale for joining us on today's show. You'll find out more at ElenaTweedale.com. She's the only person alive who spells Tweedale with one E and two Ds. This show was created by Joe Salcihai, produced by Richie Rutter-Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Kathleen Selmans handles design, newsletter, and classroom opportunities. If you'd like to learn more, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash classes. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm pretty much the guy in charge of everything around here. Trust me, this well-oiled machine didn't get like this all by itself. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Join us right back here on Monday when we talk to New York Times bestselling author John Acuff about getting finished. Tired of starting and not getting the job done? We're all about that on Monday's show. Speaking of finished, stick a fork in this show because this baby's done.
What's wrong with you? Uh, it's either this show or indigestion. I hope it's indigestion. Why? It'll get better in a little while. 